Bill, you explain upcoming war prophecies in detail that I had no idea about, including Armageddon is not what we think, and the biblical Mideast peace plan and other wars have to take place before the tribulation. Explain. Yes, Jeannie. Uh, thank you for having me back on the program. And there's a lot of things we want to talk about today that have vastly been overlooked regarding God's peace plan for the Middle East, part one, part two, part one happened in the 20th century. It's already found fulfillment, part one, part two happens in the 21st century, probably in the very near future. And then ultimately we'll probably carry off into the uh, interesting explanations of Zechariah chapter 12. You know, many people connect Zechariah chapter 12 to the Armageddon campaign. But in reality, it seems to be a separate war, at least Zechariah 12, verses 1 through 9. So I have some very fascinating new insights to share with your, your audience. Yeah, when I read uh, some of what, some of the insights about that, I'm like, okay, I had no idea. I've had everything so mixed up. I mean, mixing up even wars that I didn't know about, um, and then mixing up Ezekiel and with this, with Armageddon, mixing up Zechariah 12 with Armageddon. I mean, it's like I had everything so mixed up, so I'm so excited for you to explain. And that's an important thing, Jamie, putting the right prophecies in the right time placements. Have they been historically fulfilled? Are they waiting fulfillment? When will they find fulfillment? Will it be before the tribulation or are they going to happen in the tribulation or even even in the millennium? You know, some of the even we get into Zechariah chapter 12, verses 10 through 14, we find ourselves going into the millennium. So, you know, finding the right time placement of Bible prophecies is extremely important to see how this will all lay out. And God wants us to know the time placement because he gives us his information to equip us for the days in which we live. Yeah, now I'd like you to start with um, the two-part compassionate uh, Mideast peace plan. Yeah, it's of course, and that's a really good place to start because right now in the midst of this war that's going on with Israel and the, and the Hamas, uh, you find that the Biden administration is starting to again echo the sentiments, the same failed footsteps of his predecessors, you know, with Clinton and Obama and even Bush, the two-state solution with Jerusalem being the capital, East Jerusalem being the capital of a Palestinian state. We see that Biden, he's always wanted that, and he's starting to talk about that again. So we have to realize that that is not biblically endorsed. Dividing God's land, especially Jerusalem, is not biblically endorsed. He has his own peace plan in place. He issued it in Jeremiah chapter 12, verses 14 through 17, about 2,500 years ago, and in two parts. I just talked about this. Part one happened in the 20th century. Well, let's look at that for a moment. I'm going to read to your audience Jeremiah chapter 12, verses 14 and 15, and then explain how it's an amazing thing that God did accomplish in the 20th century. Now, setting the uh, precedent or, or sort of the foundation for what I'm about to say, we need to realize that God knows the end from the beginning. And he knew that when the Jews would be brought back into the land, which they were in the diaspora for 1878 years from 70 AD to 1948 AD, he, he promised he'd bring them back in the land and Ezekiel chapter 36 and many other places. And so he brings them back in the land, but he knew when he brought them back in the land that there would be an ancient hatred that had plagued the region since time immemorial by their Arab neighbors. And that, that he would have to deal with that situation. And he's a loving, compassionate God. So he, he tells us what he's going to do. Now, that, that that ancient hatred, he knew it would be embraced in a a, a, a violent religion of Islam. Actually, it's a Jew-hating religion. And so he knew that would happen. And he knew that he would have to deal with all that in order to have the Jews come back successfully into the promised land of Israel. And so here's what he says he's going to do. In Jeremiah chapter 12, verses 14 and 15, he says, Thus says the Lord against all my evil neighbors. So look, notice he's calling the neighborhood, the neighbors, the Arab states that share common borders with Israel. He's calling them evil neighbors, not good neighbors. They who touch the inheritance which I have caused my people, Israel, to inherit, meaning the land of Israel. They've encroached upon the borders. Behold, I will pluck them out of their land and pluck out the house of Judah from among them. Very forceful language. He's going to have to make this happen. Neither the evil neighbors nor the Israeli people are going to do this voluntarily. He's going to pluck them out. And what he's saying there is he's going to, the Arab peoples had, over the diaspora, had gone into the promised land of Israel. It was called Palestine in 
135 AD, it was renamed Palestine, never was really a country. It was always loosely defined borders, depending on whatever, whoever controlled the area. But it was called Palestine, and then in 1948, it became Israel. And so he was saying, I'm going to pluck out the evil neighbors from what is now going to be called Israel, put them back in their ancient homelands. And I'm going to pluck the Jews out who were living in some of those Arab, state, Arab countries there, lands, and bring them back into what is now going to be called Israel. So we saw that happen in 1948. Now, he goes on to say, and let me explain how that happened. This is a land for peace deal extraordinaire. If we want to talk about land for peace deals, what he had to do, and the Ottoman Empire had controlled the Middle East from 1517 to 1917. There could be no Arab states or Israel with them having control over that area. So in World War I, they got defeated, the Ottoman Empire, the Turks. And all of a sudden we find in the 20th century, the lands, the Arabs starting to get their states back. So for instance, uh, Egypt was 1922, got its statehood. Saudi Arabia and Iraq were 1932. Uh, Iran, formerly Persia, was called Iran in 1935. Lebanon, 1943, Jordan and Syria, 1946, and then along comes Israel, 1948. So we see that the this Arab states got their statehood. This is a sovereign act of God. He said he would put them back into their lands. I'll, I'll continue to read these verses and show you how that plays out. Yeah, now, you know, it's just amazing to me because it's like everybody thinks about in the 1900s that Israel became a nation fulfilling Bible prophecy. But then when you talk about, you know, this prophecy in Jeremiah, I mean, I never even thought about all the Arab states getting their statehood in the 1900s. I mean, it was like one after another it's, and just, I mean, totally fulfilling it. Correct. It wasn't just Israel. Everybody focused, and, and that was a major miracle, of course. No ethnic group had ever been dispersed outside of their homeland for over 400 years and never survived. But Israel, 1878 years out into the nations of the world, restored back into their homeland. So that in itself is an incredible miracle, but we do take our sight off the ball when we just think it's Israel. Those Arab states got their statehood back, and this is all part of what God said he would do. So I'm going to review what I've read, and then we're going to talk this further to these two verses. The Lord says against my evil neighbors, I will, who touch the inheritance of my land, Israel, I cause my people Israel to inherit that. I'll pluck them out of their land, the Arabs, and the house of Judah, the Israelis, I'll pluck them, the Jews, I'll pluck them out of the Arab lands and bring them back into Israel, which happened in 1948 and is still going on. And then it shall be, after I have plucked them out, that I will return and have compassion on them and bring them back, everyone, not just the Jews, but the Arabs as well, everyone to his heritage and everyone to his land. So he's going to bring them back in their land and to their heritages. He's not going to deprive them of that. So we see that has been transpiring in the 20th century, an amazing, miraculous, supernatural feat of the Lord, not the United Nations. This is God's sovereignty fulfilling those first two verses written 2,500 years ago, Jamie. So, and then we get into part two. You want me to go on with that? Or do you want to ask a question or do you want me to keep going? Um, uh, no, definitely go into part two. Okay, so God is loving, very compassionate. Uh, even though the neighbors are evil, they're worshiping the wrong God in Islam, Allah, but he loves them. And that's why he sent Jesus Christ, his son, to die for everyone, that everyone who would believe in him, put their faith in him, would not perish, but have everlasting life, the evil neighbors included, as long as they would believe in Jesus Christ. So he goes on to say, in part two, Jeremiah chapter 12, verses 16 through 17, and it shall be... If they will learn carefully the ways of my people, meaning the evil neighbors, the ways of the Jewish people, to swear by my name, the God of the Bible, Jehovah, as the Lord lives, as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they shall be established in the midst of my people. So what he's saying there is that all I'm asking for this amazing thing I'm doing for you evil neighbors, by giving you back to your lands and your heritages, is that you swear by my, by my name like you taught my people back in Jeremiah's time who to swear by Baal, the false god Baal. And at that time, Janie, uh, they were worshiping Baal, the false god, and worshiping their children with that kind of zeal, with that pagan worship. And God is saying with that same kind of zeal, not, of course, not sacrificing your children, but with that same kind of zeal, worship me now, like you taught my people back then to worship the false god. And he's, and so we find out, Jamie, that they're, they're not doing that. 
they're not understanding what we're talking about here, that those states, their statehoods and heritage and regatherings being plucked out and put back in there as evil neighbors. They don't understand that God did that. And they're still worshiping Islam, Allah, the, the false God, not Jehovah. And they're not swearing by God's name, which is what he said you, you should you need to do that. Because if you don't do that, here's here's what happens. And here's what's going to find fulfillment in the 21st century, probably in the near future. We're probably already starting to see it happening in this Israeli Gaza war with Hamas. He goes on to say, but if they do not obey, the evil neighbors do not obey and swear by my name like they taught my people of Israel to swear by Baal. If they do not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, says the Lord. We're talking about the utter destruction plucking up of nations, Janie. And and that is what we see the Gaza is going to go down. That's happening right now. Israel is going to control that. We're going to start seeing the other surrounding nations, the evil neighbors being utterly plucked up and destroyed. And then that would lead us into some of those biblical prophecies that I think are related to Psalm 83 and probably climax and conclude in the final siege they'll try to make against Jerusalem and Judah in Zechariah chapter 12. Yeah, now explain the, um, Psalm 83 then, because we, and then how that's related to um, Zechariah 12. All right, Psalm 83, you know, there's two major wars that are forthcoming, and one of them is Psalm 83, I think it's the next one. And, and you then, said all of this has to happen before the tribulation. The, the Psalm 83 war, I believe, has to happen before the tribulation, and the secondary war that I think is a real big one is Ezekiel 38 and 39. That that's people are split on when that happens. I personally have reasons to believe that actually happens also before the tribulation, but I think it happens subsequent to Psalm 83, but before the tribulation period. Now, Psalm 83 uh, deals with the evil neighbors, all the countries round about Israel that share common borders with Israel, that got their lands, the states we just talked about, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, etc., uh, they're all listed in this prophecy written 3,000 years ago by the prophet Asaph. Asaph was a worship leader for King David, but we're also told he was a, a seer, a prophet, Second Chronicles 29, verse 30. And he, at a time when Israel was, you know, had won wars with their King David, we're talking about building their temple, they were living at peace. He comes up with this prophecy that's pretty much talking about the Arabs around Israel wanting to destroy the nation of Israel. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, read some of it for your audience here. Yeah, so, and it's very, very specific um, countries that form a confederacy. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and go into Psalm 83. Just go, give me a moment here. I'm going to start with verse 3. And he's talking about the evil neighbors, clearly, and we'll, they'll be identified in verses 6 through 8. But verse 3 says, They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted together against thy hidden ones. They have come and said, Let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. They have consulted together with one consent, and they form a confederacy against you. So basically what they're saying there is, is these Arab countries, the evil neighbors, are going to come together and form a devious plan, crafty council, with the intent of wiping Israel off the map. But not only wiping Israel off the map, but banishing Israel from remembrance. No more remembrance of, of the Jewish state of Israel at all. And then it says they form a confederacy. So it's a contemporary confederacy. It's not, we're going to find out as we read who they are. It's not a chronological ordering of Israel's enemies, which they've had plenty throughout time. But this is actually a contemporary confederacy that comes together with an evil plan. And they want to wipe Israel off the map. And he goes on and lists who they are by their ancient names. I won't read those names. It's talking about Edomites and Ammonites and Moabites, etc. Because those were the populations he knew back in his day, 3,000 years ago. But he did not know about Jordanians and Palestinians and things like that. So, But he does talk about the tents of Edom. And that he's listing them first among 10 populations in a habitation condition. Now, tents of, in the Bible can be military encampments, but more than likely in this instance, allude to a refugee conditions. And the Edomites have ethnical representation into the Palestinians today. So I believe he's talking to us about the Palestinian refugees. They're listed first. The, the other members of the Confederacy are bannering their plight. And so we have the Palestinian refugees leading off a Confederacy. And of course, that's what the Arab states want. Uh, they want another Arab state. They don't want a Jewish state. They want a state called Palestine. 
they start with a two-state solution, but that would be very dangerous for Israel. It won't happen because that would put the grips, the, the noose around Israel's neck even closer if they had a Palestinian state. So it's not in biblical. It's not going to happen. And the land for peace deals and political uh, wranglings are not going to put this together. They've failed miserably throughout time, especially modern history. But what will happen is the Israeli Defense Forces will win the wars militarily and the nations around them will be utterly plucked up and destroyed. So he lists those nations uh, around about Lebanon, Syria, Iraq would be involved, Jordan, even though Jordan has a fragile peace treaty with Israel right now, that will be voided out in numerous prophecies, which I put forward in a book I have called The Future War Prophecies, I, I explain, and also in a book I have called Psalm 83, The Missing Prophecy Revealed. I put forward how Jordan will be voiding out that treaty and will be going to war with Israel as part of Psalm 83, and they will be defeated and Israel will annex territory inside of Jordan, as according to Jeremiah chapter 49.2 and Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. Then you also have as we said, the Palestinian refugees, the tents of Edom, you have the Gaza, probably alluding to the Hamas, but ancient banner of the name Philistia. That's where the Gaza is. That's where Israel is going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Hamas presently as we air this show. Uh, you have Egypt in there under the banner of the Hagarines. You have Saudi Arabia there under the banner of the Ishmaelites. These are the countries and that went to war with Israel in 1948, and they were unsuccessful. And uh, so that we find out that that's what they'd want to do. They want to destroy Israel. And verse 12 tells us they want to take the motive. They want to take the land of Israel for a possession. And so that's what we see is playing out. It's been playing out since 1948. And it's going to find a final climactic including uh, thing in Zechariah 12, verses 2 through 6, I believe. Uh, and that's when the evil neighbors will be utterly plucked up and destroyed as the nations. Now, um, how would, um, because... I know I've been, you know, listening to other interviews you've done and and reading your book also. It's like, how would Hezbollah, because we know that they have to do something, you know, regarding Hezbollah and Iran's proxies. So what do you think would happen next after they uh, defeat um, Hamas? Well, uh, I believe under the Hezbollah inside of Lebanon, in Psalm 83, they're mentioned as the inhabitants of Tyre, another group among the 10-member confederacy of Psalm 83 listed in a habitation condition. And they're the inhabitants of Tyre. And and when you look at the, the Hebrew word, it sounds like it's sort of like a state within a state, kind of a ruling authority that's been established there. And that's exactly what Hezbollah has become as an Iranian proxy established by Iran. So Hezbollah is probably involved in this prophecy as Tyre is listed. Tyre is still a city inside of Lebanon, but it was also a city back at the time of the psalm with Asaph. And basically what I believe will happen, and we're already hearing rumors of war about this, if we want to call it that, with the uh, Israeli Defense Minister Gallant. He's basically saying just recently that uh, they're because you've got to remember there's still over 80-some thousand Jewish people who have left the northern area of Israel and are uh, evacuated mandatorily, uh, living in hotels in Tel Aviv, paid by the government, many of them, that don't want to go back to the northern cities, the northern borders of Israel, because they don't want another massacre like happened on October 7th with Hamas. They don't want that to happen with Hezbollah, who's far more powerful than the Hamas. So Golan has come out to the defense minister and said, we will, we will not... And these people will not go back, feel comfortable, comfortable to go back to their homes in the northern part of Israel until we have pushed back Hezbollah to the uh, uh, the north side of the Lathani River. Now, the Lathani River is 18 miles or so north of the Lebanon border. And and, and resolution, you know, resolution 1701 said that uh, at the end of the Israeli conflict back in 2006 with Hezbollah, the 34-day conflict, the resolution said that the the Hezbollah had to be back north of that river, and they were not to have any, build any more missiles or anything like, like that. Well, they they're not north of that river. They've got entrenchments south of that river, right on the border of Israel. Oh. They've also got all kinds of missiles. They've got about one hundred fifty thousand missiles. Some of them precision guided. They can hit any target in Israel with pinpoint accuracy that they got from Iran for the most part. And so Israel is going to deal with them, in my estimation, and that would also be part of the Psalm 83 scenario. 
Okay, and then um, then how would that lead to um, well, Isaiah 17 with uh, Damascus? I think it would. I think you've got a connection there. Also, remember that Syria, Bashar al-Assad, the president of Syria, is also beholding to Iran as an agent. We'll call him a proxy of Iran. Uh, they used chemical weapons, by the way. Syria did Assad on his countrymen, the, the rebels, about 300 times, according to NPR uh, report. And so they got chemical weapons, and they've used them against their enemies. And I believe what's going to happen is uh, they're going to get involved. And once Hezbollah gets involved, Syria's going to be involved, perhaps even Iraq, Iran, rather. But also you got the Houthis, are a proxy of Iran. They're down south of Yemen. You've got shared militias in Iraq. They're also proxies of Iran. So I think we could be looking if when this escalates, and I do believe it will, probably very soon as phase two starts to happen. Uh, I do believe they will get everyone involved, including Syria, and you will probably see Estimates are Hezbollah could launch in the first few days of war 6,000 missiles into Israel, and they would be they prepared for this. They talked there'd be days long blackouts, hundreds dead, thousands wounded, uh, and then Syria gets involved with chemical weapons. Israel is already preparing for that, uh, and Israel finds itself in a prison rules war whereby they have to take out a city to make a statement, and the city they would take out is Damascus, the oldest continuously inhabited city in recorded history. And we find out in Isaiah 17, verse 1, Isaiah says around 740 B.C., someday the burden against Damascus, behold, Damascus will cease from being a city. It will be a ruinous heap. It will be reduced to rubble is what literally is being said there. And that has not happened yet. We're told in Isaiah 17, verse 9, that the desolation is caused by the children of Israel. So once again, we see the Israeli defense forces are involved in Bible prophecy for the purposes pretty much of defending the nation. And we find them probably first mentioned uh, in tasking with Psalm 83, verses 9 through 11. But also, uh, then it says in Isaiah 17, verse 14, that one night you see him speaking of Damascus and the masculine pronoun, but in the morning he is no more. The city's gone. One night you see Damascus, but in the morning it's gone. And of course, Israel has tactical nuclear weapons that could take out a city overnight. And it says this happens out of self defense because it concludes in Isaiah 17, verse 14, by saying, This is a portion of those who plunder us and those who rob us, meaning. They're trying to plunder Jerusalem. They're trying to take over Israel. And for that, in this Confederate war, uh, the proxy war that probably lead to Psalm 83, they get destroyed overnight. And Israel makes a statement. Now, we're told in Isaiah 17, 4 through 6, that when that happens, Israel takes a hit. We just talked about Hezbollah could severely hurt a lot of people with the missiles they've got, et cetera, a lot of Jewish, Jewish people. It talks about the idiom that Isaiah says is that the glory of Jacob will fade and the fatness of his flesh will grow lean. And there's a shaking that goes on, like the shaking of an olive tree that leaves only about two olives in the uppermost branch and four or five in the fruitful boughs. And if you understand, now an olive tree is actually the natural national tree of Israel, very common in the Middle East. It can have a fruited variety of over 500,000 olives on it, but there's going to be a shaking at the time that Israel gets hit in Isaiah 17. And many Jewish people will unfortunately be killed. So if you if you superimpose an olive tree over a map of Israel, the northern part, the uppermost branches, just a few olives out of the 500,000 and the fruitful boughs, bow, four or five olives, at probably Tel Aviv area. And of course, they're already threatening Hezbollah, Iran, and Syria to take out Tel Aviv and Haifa. So, I mean, I think we are looking at something that's about to happen, probably in the near future, to fulfill this entire prophecy in Isaiah 17. And when the Arab states see that Israel has taken out a city, and by the way, Syria, who was taken out of the Arab League during the revolution, has now been brought back into the Arab League as a member of the 22-member Arab League. When the Arab countries see Damascus get destroyed overnight by Israel, and that Israel is hurt and wounded, because of the war that's been going on with Hezbollah in Syria, I think they're going to come around and say, well, our cities could be next, Beirut, Amman, Jordan, 
Cairo, Egypt, Mecca, and Saudi Arabia, and actually Imam Jordan will probably be next in Jeremiah chapter 49 too. I think they're going to rally around and say, well, listen, Israel's hurt. We've tried to take them off the map before. We were unsuccessful in 48, 1967, and 1973, but we can get them now. Let's take them out now. And I believe that's when they do a final siege on Judah and Jerusalem in fulfillment, Zechariah 12, verse 2. Okay, right. So, but with um, the uh, Psalm 83, it, they were they're unsuccessful and um and back to damascus i had i you know for years i always heard about you know damascus being destroyed and i always found that very interesting because here's this prophecy written so many thousands of years you know a long time ago and it's like talking about a very specific city and i never really thought about this until i heard you say this that basically syria is where iran and hezbollah bring in weapons so it's it's definitely a place that needs to be you know destroyed so they can't um destroy israel exactly it is a it's a target that israel's got in its scope they've already said in the past that they would just and, they, and they've been bombing around damascus for quite some time now trying to stop the flow of weapons getting from iran through syria into hezbollah uh, as the October 7th confrontation, the massacre with Hamas happened, uh, shortly thereafter, they actually took out the, Dam Israel took out the Damascus airport and the Aleppo airport. Isaiah 17 verse 9 talks about, you know, major cities being desolated, not just Damascus. So, I mean, we already see Israel's taking, attacking Damascus. So this is not going to be anything new. Right. Oh, yeah. Now, um, please lead into Zechariah uh, 12 and what you call the climactic conclusion of Psalm 83. War. Okay. All right. Let's do that. Um, I'm going to read Zechariah 12. Well, let me kind of summarize first before we get into the details. Zechariah 12, verse 2, talks about a time coming when Jerusalem will be made by God as a cup of trembling or dizziness in some translations, to all the surrounding peoples round about when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And he's clearly talking about, with the, the Hebrew word saviv, the neighborhood, the, the peoples round about. Matter of fact, when you study this word, and it's important to do this because what happens as we study Zechariah 12, Verses 3 and verse 9 almost sound like maybe we're talking about Armageddon, but the reality is we can point, break this down where we're really not talking about that final Armageddon campaign. We're actually talking about something probably related to Psalm 83 that could happen in the very near future and conclude the Arab Israeli conflict. I think this should be the climactic concluding aspect of the Arab Israeli conflict and the utter destruction of the evil neighbor nations in fulfillment of Zechari Jeremiah 12. Verse 17. So, Janie, I think it's important to understand who we're actually identifying in Zechariah 12, verse 2, that are going to attempt to lay a siege against Judah and Jerusalem. Uh, basically, we're talking about the evil neighbors that we've been pointing out in this video. Uh, so, several versions clearly make this sound the, the case. It's the surrounding peoples in the New International Version. Uh, it'll be a cup of intoxication to the nearby nations. They'll stagger when they send their armies to besiege Jerusalem. The New Living Translation. I'll read a couple more real quickly. The New American Standard. He calls them the, the cup of reeling to all those peoples round about. I, I could go on and read every translation in the Bible. It talks about the surrounding peoples, the neighbors, so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, we're even told in one of the first usages of the term in Genesis 23, verse 17, it says that they were in the neighbors around Israel. They're at the, all the borders round about. So we're talking about the bordering nations, just to make the point I'm trying to establish here. Right, right. If not, so that it's not being Armageddon and really being part of the Psalm 83 war. Right, in that verse. Now, here's where it gets confusing for some people. They go into the next verse, it says, and in that day, now, in, now let's break that down, in that day, in the day that the nations round about the your common borders with Israel, the evil neighbors, when they attempt to lay siege on Judah and Jerusalem, in that day, and in that day I'll make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people, now, not just the surrounding people, but the international community at large, and all that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, although... All the people of the earth are gathered together against it. And that can also mean assembled against it. And so 
I would break that down to what I'm saying here is basically as we see this climactic concluding aspect of the Arab Israeli conflict, they're going to make a final siege against Judah and Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem is the third holiest city in Islam, even though it's not mentioned one time in the Quran. That's where the Temple Mount is. That's where they they have their mosque, the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome, the Dome of the Rock. So they're going to try to protect that and lay a final siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And the international community is going to meddle. They're going to clamor about that. We've already seen this happen in 1947, the United Nations, when it came to Jerusalem. They would not allow it to be the capital of Israel. Israel is going to become a nation, but the United Nations said it's going to be an international zone. And then in 1948, the Arabs went to war with the Jews in the War of Independence, and they lost. And then they, they, we had the uh, armistice, armistice Agreement, which is when they drew the line of demarcation, the green line that divided Jerusalem in half. And that is not biblically endorsed. The dividing of Jerusalem is not biblically endorsed. And it didn't last more than 20 years because in 1967, in the Six-Day War, Israel took over Jerusalem, all of Jerusalem. Now, they made the colossal mistake of giving control over the Temple Mount to Jordan. So they're, they're paying a price for that even today. Um, and then you go on and talks about the, you see our presidents, uh, Bill Clinton around 2000 tried to make a two state solution, uh, give each Jerusalem to the Palestinians. That failed. George Bush tried the same thing. Uh, 2014, John Kerry as, uh, the Secretary of State with Barack Obama, he tried the same thing. It failed. Joe Biden is trying the same thing. Matter of fact, as we see this, getting worse in the Gaza right now with Israel really winning that war in the Gaza right now with against Hamas. We're starting to see the international community clamoring again. You need a ceasefire. Uh, don't hurt the civilians. Even got Belgium and some European countries coming out right now saying we're not going to allow the Israeli settlers to come over to our lands. Now we're talking because of the West Bank. There's violence going on in the West Bank between the uh, the Palestinians there and the Israeli settlers. So we're seeing that as things get worse, and, and the Gaza-Hamas area, we're told in Zephaniah chapter 2, is actually part of Judah. It's going to be for flocks for Judah and the Messianic kingdom. So we talk about laying siege on Judah and Jerusalem. We're seeing that Israel is already winning the war in parts of what will be Judah's tribal territory, and the international community is in an uproar. you know. And even Biden is saying, you know, then you, know, you can go ahead and win your war against Hamas, but you're going to have the Palestinian Authority that's going to have to rule over there. Don't take it over and rule over yourself. Now, Netanyahu's going, it's going to be a demilitarized zone that we're going to take care of because we can't trust the, the Palestinian Authority to, you know, uh, to run that area because they're, they're not friends of Israel as well. So it goes on talking about the meddling of the international community. But what's very interesting is it goes on to say in verse 4, another in that day, so in that day that they, they seize on Judah and Jerusalem, the neighbors round about, the evil neighbors, and the world is clamoring and it becomes a burdensome stone that the, the Lord is saying, don't try to move it and don't try to meddle because it's going to grievously hurt you if you do. That was verse 3. And that's where a lot of people start thinking, well, now we're talking about Armageddon because as all the nations are talked about here. But you're but, saying all the nations is just meddling. It's not all the nations as as Armageddon war against Israel. Right, and we're going to come back to that time permitting to show where they connect Zechariah 14, 1 through 3, especially verse 2 of Zechariah 14, thinking that that defines affiliation here, and I'm going to show the differences that it absolutely doesn't. So it's in that day when the they try to lay siege the evil neighbors on Judah and Jerusalem, the Lord's going to divinely intervene on behalf of Israel, and he's going to actually work in concert with the Israeli Defense Forces, we find out, out in the next two, three verses, Zechariah 12, 14, Zechariah 12, verse 4, through Zechariah 12, verse 6. And here's what it says. Zechariah 12, we're going to break it out into 14. Zechariah 12, we're going to break verse 4 into A, B, and C. A, in that day the Lord says, I will strike every horse with confusion and every rider with madness. I will my eyes on the house of Judah, and I will strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. So he's talking about intervening. He says, I will do these things. I will strike every horse with confusion. Now, they're not going to be riding in the Arab neighbors on horseback. Of course, back in Zechariah's time, they didn't have tanks and you know planes and things like that. So he used the idiom of war that he had, the, 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 the transportation of war that they had back then, and that those horses. And I'm going to tell you what I believe he's saying here. 
the Lord's going to intervene. I will do this thing. He says, and, and that day I will strike every horse with confusion. And then, so it appears the first thing he does to level the playing field against the vast Arab armies coming against Israel, who's been hurt by Isaiah 17, the glory of Jacob had faded, the fatness of his flesh had grown lean. They're, they're, the, they're going to lay seas, the international community is going to meddle and be in an uproar, and the Lord is going to get involved. And that's why he warns the international community, don't get involved. It'll be a burdensome stone. He says, I'm going to strike every horse with confusion. So first it appears that the Lord causes the Arab artilleries, tanks, and armors vehicles to malfunction. He says, I will strike every horse with confusion. Now, that has biblical precedent, Jamie, and I'm going to read you an account historically in Exodus chapter 14, verses 24 through 25. But it says, now it came to pass, this is when Moses was leading the Hebrews out of Egypt and had their backs were against the Red Sea. And Pharaoh and his armies were ready to get them in the morning. And of course, the big pillar of clouds stood between the Hebrews and Pharaoh's army, protecting the Hebrews at the Red Sea. And it says in Exodus 14, now it came to pass in the morning, watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of and fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. And here's what he did. And he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with great difficulty. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel. The Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. So he intervened divinely back then, like he's going to intervene divinely and cause the artillery and things to malfunction in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 4a. And of course, the Egyptians knew that was the God of the Jews. And then some of them said, we need to flee. He's fighting for them. So he, he, he took, I like to say, he took the lug nuts off the chariots so that the Egyptian, now these chariots were world renowned. The Egyptian chariots back at that time were the most advanced chariots in the world. They would have had no problem coming and destroying the Hebrews at the Red Sea had this not happened and had the Red, not, Red Seas not parted. Wow. So we see he's going he's gonna to use biblical precedent and level the playing field right there. Okay, so, and that's in Zechariah 12, uh, verse 4, that you're explaining in detail, which is still like a fulfillment, uh, is still is a fulfillment of Psalm 83. Yeah, so in that day again, we're talking used again, uh, Jerusalem is going to be seized by the Arabs, a burdensome stone to the international community. Uh, God's going to get in the middle. He's going to level the playing field. That was 14, Zechariah 12, 4a. Zechariah 12, 4b goes on to say when, I will strike every horse with confusion and its rider, the soldiers, the troops, with madness. So in other words, when the troops coming from all the different evil neighbors to lay siege against Jude, all the surrounding peoples round about, to lay siege against you and Jerusalem with their vast armies, thinking they're going to win, uh, when they see that the malfunctions are going on in all of their equipment and artilleries, they're going to panic. And they're going to be very concerned, like the Egyptians panicked and were very concerned. This this also happened with the Gideon and the Midianites back in the book of Judges, chapter 7, verses 20 through 22. I get into these comparisons in my Future Wars Prophecies book, and for time's sake, I won't read that account. But at that time, Gideon and his 300-man army, and by the way, Asaph petitions for this kind of military precedent in Psalm 83, verses 9 through 11. This is how Asaph petitions the Lord militarily to level the playing field in Psalm 83 against the Arab countries and divinely empower the Israeli defense forces to win the war. And so we see that the account is going to be very similar to what happened in Judges when Gideon with his 300-man army, uh, with the help of the tribe of Ephraim, took out 120,000 Midianites. And they had torches and uh, pitchers and their, their, their trumpets, and they, 300 men put the torches in their pitchers and blow their trumpets and say, the sword of the Lord and Gideon, start shouting, and 120,000 Midianites started panicking, killing one another, and fleeing. Very now, supernatural. That's the, thing, that's the same thing that's going to happen, and we're going to probably see this if this happens during the church age. We're going to see the Lord divinely, supernaturally intervene and level the playing field cause malfunctions in the artillery of these Arabs. They're, they're going to cause panic and madness. And then it's not over. Zechariah 12, verse 4, C goes on to say, and I will strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. So he's dealing again with the uh, the equipment, the tanks and the planes, et cetera, per se. And what, what he's going to do there is says, the third, the Lord will turn his favor toward the Israeli defense forces 
and somehow the guidance, radar capabilities of the enemy's tanks, jets, rockets, etc. will become disabled. I will strike every enemy horse of the peoples with blindness. So malfunctions, creates hysteria among the troops, and guidance systems go out. Now that, and we're told in Zechariah 12, verse 5, goes on and says, And the governors of Judah, the captains, shall say that the IDF, if you will, shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength, and the Lord of hosts their God. It says, Fourth, the IDF will become emboldened to battle as they witness the enemy's equipment malfunction. The Arab armies panic, and they will gain courage as they focus on their fight to regain soul sovereignty over Jerusalem. That's verses 1 through 5. Now, verse 6 is really important, and this tells us, again, we're talking about, it's important to realize who we're talking about here. It says, in that day, again, in that day, we're still focused on what's happening around the time of the siege against Jews in Jerusalem. We're going to find out that this siege is unsuccessful with the Arab countries round about the evil neighbors. It says, in that day, I will make the governors or the captains of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile, like a fiery torch in the sheaves, and they shall devour all the surrounding peoples, the evil neighbors, not the world at large, hmm. on the right hand and on the left, but Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place. So as this builds up, as the Arabs make a final attempt to lay siege on Judah and Jerusalem, verse 2, Zechariah 12, the international community gets heated up, tries to meddle, as they've already got a history of doing since Israel became a nation. And we're seeing it happen unfold presently with this war with Hamas and Israel. And then they're going to come against Jews in Jerusalem, and it, and the Lord is going to intervene and, met, and level the playing field. And then the, the Israeli defense forces are going to get emboldened. They're going to get confident when they see the Lord is working on their behalf and empowering them. And then what's going to happen is they're going to go to war. And the governors of Judah, the, the Hebrew word is Eluf, A-L-U-P-H, that is actually the, the term of a high military ranking leader in the Israeli Defense Forces today, Aluf. So he's talking about the Israeli Defense Forces. They're going to win a war. The, the battlefield is going to be like a fire fire uh, fire pan in the woodpile. The, the Israeli Defense Forces is going to be like a fiery torch in the sheaves. And the Arab armies that have already been uh, hurt by the Lord, divine intervention, are going to be like, uh, they're going to be devoured like sheaves. So we know he's going to win that war, and Israel's going to devour the ones on the right hand and on the left hand. Now, some people would say, this is dealing with all the nations of the world, so we're going to address that in a second. But it's not Israel Defense Forces defeating the kings of the East that are coming to join our, and our, the Antichrist and Armageddon, America, Russia, Japan. It's dealing with the evil neighbors and surrounding people. Well, we're going to find out that the Israeli Defense Forces are not involved in Armageddon at all. And that's where some people try to put this stuff. But what we find here is uh, those those first six verses is the conclusion, in my estimation, of Psalm 83, the Arab Israeli conflict, militarily, not through politically procured peace deals. It totally makes sense to me. I mean, your book is amazing. Everyone needs to get a, a copy of uh, the future war prophecies because there is so many more details in that book. And, and we want your viewers, you know, Janie, you, you had told me when you, we started talking before the airing this program. And I agree. Everybody pretty much for the last 2,000 years have not interpreted it the way we just interpreted it on your show. They've looked at Zechariah 12, 1 through 6 here, actually 1 through 9, as part of the Armageddon campaign. And what we're doing here is really revolutionary. We're saying it's not. Uh, the Lord, when he causes malfunctions in the artilleries, and hysteria among the soldiers and guidance the defaults in the equipment, military equipment. He's not doing it to all the nations of the world, which is what would have to happen at Armageddon. He's doing it to the surrounding peoples, that we're clearly told on the right hand and on the left hand. Very definitive. So, but here's a couple of really good quotes from very top scholars today. Mark Hitchcock, in his book called The End, says, Armageddon is a climactic war of the Great Tribulation, when all the armies gathered to attack Israel and attempt to finally eradicate the Jewish people. They will capture Jerusalem, but then Jesus Christ will return to destroy the invading armies and deliver the faithful Jewish remnant. The War of Armageddon is the subject of many biblical passages, and he goes Joel 3, 1-7, which I agree, Zechariah 12, 1-9, which I disagree, but see, he puts it there. 
Zechariah 14, 1 through 15. We'll look at Zechariah 14 in a moment. I agree. That's got something to do with that, Armageddon. Revelation 16, that's where the kings of the east gather against the dry, dry, dried up Euphrates River. That would be like the Asian countries, China probably, coming to assemble in, at Armageddon. That's the sixth bowl judgment. I agree. Revelation 19, I would agree also. That's when Jesus Christ goes up, gets his armies from heaven, and comes back and fights the Antichrist and his armies. And the Armageddon campaign includes that final battle. And then here's one from Andy Wood, just to give you another guy, and just to show you that they're, this is what they think. And I used to think this too. What This is uh, Andy, Dr. Andy Woods and Jim McGowan. Uh, it says, what does Zechariah 12, 3 say? We just talked about, remember, the burdensome stone to the nations, and don't try to move it because it will grievously wound you, international community, when you assemble against it. Right, and then you t and explained also that it was basically the nations meddling again regarding the status of Jerusalem. Yeah, because it's in that day, in that in what day, in that day that the Arabs, the evil neighbors, are going to lay siege against you in Jerusalem. In that day, that they're going to be defeated, they're going to be unsuccessful as the Israeli defense forces will just devour them. And we're not talking about a skirmish; we're talking about it's over. When it's over, the they're never going to be able to come back after Jerusalem. They're never going to fight against Israel again. And that did not happen in 1948, which is what some people suggest, like Amir Safadi, uh, because back in 1967, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria, members of Psalm 83, came back against Israel, and again in 1973. We're talking about in Zechariah 12, verse 6, if we're pinpointing the appropriate populations as Psalm 83, they're done. Once they're de defeated, God's going to divinely intervene, level the playing field, work in concert with the Israeli Defense Forces, and they're done once and for all. And that's clearly what Psalm 83 says at the end of it. It says, basically, confound them, make them perish. Remember, Zechariah, Jeremiah 12, verses 17 said, they would utterly be plucked up and destroyed, the evil neighbors. So that's going to be done when it's done. Andy Wood says, what does Zechariah 12, 3 say? It will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all peoples. All who lift it will be severely injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. All the people's doesn't that include everyone, including the United States? So, see, they're throwing in that that's going to be Zechariah 12, 6, where we just saw the Israeli Defense Forces are going to take out the Arabs. They're saying they're going to take out the United States and all these other places as well because they think it's all the nations. Mm. All the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. And how many times does God have to say something for us to get it down? I mean, I think once is enough, but he basically then through Zechariah repeats himself a chapter or so later in Zechariah chapter 4, 14, verses 2 through 3. So see, here's, I think, unknowingly, I mean, I'm not trying to say these guys haven't done their research, but I think what they're basically not realizing that they're saying is that, I'm going to read Zechariah 14, verse 2 in just a second. They're connecting Zechariah 12, verse 3, when the nations meddle at the time of the siege of the Arabs against Jude and Jerusalem, they're connecting that with Zechariah chapter 14, which is clearly dealing with, in my estimation, a different Jerusalem scenario. <laughs> Remember that Jerusalem in Zechariah chapter 12 is the Lord is making it a, a cup of trembling to the Arab countries. And they try to lay siege and they lose. It's un, their siege is unsuccessful. But now we're going to see in Zechariah chapter 14 a successful siege on Jerusalem. And we're told in Zechariah chapter 14. Which is Armageddon. Uh, yeah. I agree with Andy Woods and Hitchcock and, and John Wolvert and many other people who try to make these connections, as you and I also did before this program, right? Actually, I've been I've been I've been interpreting it this way since my Psalm 83 book back in 19, excuse me, uh, 2013. Um, it says, "Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem." So we're going to see all those nations. International community is going to be gathered to battle against Jerusalem. That's going to happen at the Armageddon scenario. The city shall be taken. So we got a successful siege, not an unsuccessful siege. The houses will be rifled and the women ravished. It's going to be a horrendous situation for the Jewish people around Jerusalem at that time. Half of the city shall go into captivity. So basically, we have two different scenarios in my estimation. You have a highly unsuccessful siege that the Lord gets in the middle of and empowers the Israeli defense forces to wipe out the, devour the Arab countries around them, roundabout. 
Then you have a different scenario subsequently. I believe this would happen around the mid part of the tribulation. The Antichrist comes together with many of his armies against Jerusalem. They ransack the houses. They rape the women. And Jesus says, when you see the Antichrist going into the temple, which he will then go into the temple, the mid part of the tribulation in Matthew 24, verses 15, Jesus said, when you see that, uh, the abomination of desolation is spoken by Daniel the prophet in the holy place. That's when the Antichrist is going to go into the temple, desecrate it, set up his image, declare himself to be called God above, the, above all things that are called God. And Jesus said, when you see that, you need to flee immediately. Flee to the mountains. And the mountains he's alluding to would be in Petra, Jordan, southern Jordan, which Israel had possession of by that time after Psalm 83 when they annexed Jordan, which is part of the promised land. And they will annex Jordan in Jeremiah 49, verses 2, and Zephaniah, verses 2, 8 through 9. And anybody who's heeding what Christ said will flee. And mm -hmm. ultimately, we find in Zechariah 13, 8, that when the Antichrist, the reason he's warning them to flee is because he foreknows that the Antichrist is going to try to commit the final genocidal attempt of the Jewish people. And that sort of triggers the whole campaign of Armageddon. Armageddon is not really a battle. Armageddon is a campaign, and I put 11 phases of it. It culminates in some major battles in in parts of Jordan and around Jerusalem, et cetera. Like that. But Armageddon is where the, uh, the Mount, Mount Megiddo, Har Megiddo, H -A -R Megiddo, Megiddo is how it's in the American Standard Version. It means the Mount Megiddo. It's the Jezreel Valley. It's a massive valley uh, where they will assemble. The kings of the east will go there. That's what we find out in Revelation 16, verses 14, I think it is. River Euphrates dries up with the sixfold judgment. The kings of the east come, uh, massive armies coming to join the Antichrist, etc. But I believe at the mid part of the tribulation, the Antichrist takes over Jerusalem, uh, ravishes the houses, the women. Then he goes into the temple, and Jesus says, Flee when you see that. Because in Zechariah 13 8, we're told two thirds of the Jewish people in the land will be killed, they'll be cut off. But one third, they call them the faithful remnant, will come through that. And that's the faithful remnant that Jesus will return for. It will be in Petra. And what happens at the end of the tribulation period, the final stages of the Armageddon campaign, when the Antichrist has assembled his vast armies in the Jezreel Valley, uh, they're, they're going to march around, they're going to skirt around east of the Dead Sea down the King's Highway. I, I point this out, pinpoint the, with accuracy, actually the deployment path of the Antichrist and his, many of his armies, his troops, they're going to skirt around the Dead Sea into Jordan, which will be possessed by Israel at that time, to try to get the final third of the Jewish remnant hiding in Petra, Jordan, and the, the rock fortress down there in southern Jordan. It's the southern part of the mountains, the southern part of Jordan, and they're going to go to Basra, which is now modern-day Bazira. We find out in Isaiah 34 and Isaiah 63. That's where they're headed. They're going to come to Basra, which is modern-day Bazira. It's at the northern part of those mountains. It's where they would make their final deployment for an attack to go down to Petra and get the final remnant. And when they when this happens, the Jewish remnant is going to shout out, realize Jesus Christ is the Messiah. They're going to shout, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which will fulfill the mandate of Matthew 23, where Jesus said, you will not see me again to the leaders of Israel until you say that. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're going to do that. And Hosea 5.15 tells us they will do this. It says, I will return to my place, Jesus says, I'm quoting Hosea 5.15, I will return to my place, which Jesus has returned to his place in heaven, and until they seek my face, which they will do that at the end of the tribulation, it says, in their affliction, they will seek my face, and they will earnestly seek my face. So we're told that in the tribulation period at the end, when the Antichrist is barreling down with his armies into Basra, and there'll be a slaughter there, we're told in Isaiah 34, by Jesus Christ, they're going to say, you know, we're, we're, we're doomed. Two-thirds of our people, of countrymen, have already been killed by this antics of this Antichrist and his armies. They've ravished the houses. They've raped the women. They're coming after us now. And they're going to say our only hope is Jesus the Messiah. He is the Messiah. And they're going to beckon his return, and he's going to come for them. In Isaiah 63, verses 1 through 6, we're told that he comes single-handedly. It says, who is this that comes to eat him? That, that area there, Basra and Petra, as in ancient Edom, southern Jordan modern-day southern Jordan. It says, who is this comes from to Edom with blood-stained garments? And it says, it is I, mighty to save, referring to Jesus Christ the Messiah. I come alone, no one is with me. 
And so single-handedly, this is the year of my redeemed, single-handedly he destroys all of them himself. So not remember, if we're going to think about that, this is the end, this is toward Armageddon. Now, the Jewish people, whatever's left of them, about a third of them, they're refugees in exile. They're non. They're in a non-combatant mode. They've fled, and Jesus said you should flee. He, they, he said in Matthew 24, 15, don't, don't fight, but flee. So they're non-combatant. They're exiles. They're fearful for their very existence. And they beckon Jesus to come. He comes, and he single-handedly wins the war in Isaiah 63. Isaiah 34 says there's a great slaughter, a great sacrifice in Basra. It connects with Isaiah 63. And then so here he's got these exiles. He's going to bring them back to Jerusalem. Now, if, if we're going to try to connect Zechariah 12, verses 6, and Zechariah chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, etc., with the Israeli Defense Forces winning a war against all the nations at Armageddon with the Antichrist and the armies, how are they going to do that? When, one, we find out Jesus does it himself in Isaiah 63. We also find that in Isaiah, uh, Revelation chapter 19. It says, I, I come with my sword, on a white horse, and I destroy these these armies single-handedly. So we have two verses that Jesus does it single-handedly, not with the help of the Israeli defense forces, who at that point in time are non-existent. They're just exiles. So how are they going to be empowered in Zechariah 12, verses 6, to devour all the nations that people would suggest must be happening here? Like Andy Wood said, doesn't that include America or the kings of the East, etc.? They're not going to be able to do that because the point is they're separate events. Zechariah chapter 12, verses 6, is the Israeli Defense Forces stopping and making a siege against Jews in Jerusalem by the evil neighbors unsuccessful. Zechariah chapter 14 is a different scenario, verse 2. It's a successful siege. And the Israeli Defense Forces, and also remember in Zechariah chapter 14, too, it doesn't sound like Jerusalem is a burdensome stone that can't be moved, that'll fall back and, and grievously wound those who try to move it. No, there's no problem. There's no stone to be moved. They're just move, moving in and taking over the city. They're mowing it down. <laughs> so basically, we've got all kinds of different reasons why we cannot connect, in my estimation, Zechariah 12, 1 through 9, through Zechariah um, 14 and Revelation 16 and Revelation 19 and Joel 3, which those other those latter ones, they all are all part of Armageddon, but I don't believe Zechariah 12, 1 through 9 is. Another couple of arguments we should probably address before we close, Janie, is the argument of in that day, is that dealing with the day of the Lord, the tribulation period? And the other one is, uh, uh, what about the mourning that's going on in Zechariah 12, verses 1, verses 10 through 14? Those are very important topics. Because it appears as though there's a pause. Zechariah 12, 1 through 9 would deal with, in my estimation, the unsuccessful siege by the Arab countries the Israeli Defense Forces defeating them. And then there's a pause that goes into Zechariah 12, verses 10 through 14. Now remember, the Israeli Defense Forces have just seen their God divinely intervene, level the playing field, and they, they've won their war against the evil neighbors around them. They should be slam dunking the football in the end zone. They should be doing backflips. They should be <laughs> jubilant. But then we find out, no, they're not, if you're going to try to connect this all to the same passage and I, I don't i put a gap here huh you know also now they're mourning why would they be mourning when they've just been vic victors and victorious it makes no sense at uh, all very interesting okay the reason they're mourning is it goes on to say i'll pour the house i'll pour on the house of david and on the inhabitants of jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication then they will look upon me whom they pierce in other words they're actually going to physically see him Jesus Christ is going to come at the second coming. He's going to return. He's going to defeat the Antichrist and the armies at Armageddon. He's going to bring the Jewish remnant back into Israel. They're going to see him. It says they'll mourn for him like an only son and grieve for him as one who grieves for a firstborn. They're going to realize he's the Messiah and that generationally rejection of him has caused great harm to the Jewish people. Matter of fact, a lot of the people that were killed by the Antichrist were probably family members of theirs. And they, they needed, it would have been nice if Jesus would have, they would have beckoned him to come a whole lot sooner, but they wait till the very end until they realize that he is the Messiah and say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're going to be mourning for him, realizing he is the Messiah, like an only son. It says, and in that day, when Jesus has returned and they're realizing he, he died, he is the Messiah and they're mourning for him. It says, in that day, there should be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like that. And Hammond talks about examples. 
I mean, he goes on to say, and that and and the land shall mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David itself, and the wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan itself, and the wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi. And he goes on talking about the family of Shani, and he says, and, and he says, all the families. Basically, so what you have here is a resurrection. You have to have you have to have David in his house there. You have to have Nathan in his house there. You have to have Levi in his tribes there. So basically, the house, the house of Levi. That's part of the millennial kingdom when the Old Testament saints are resurrected along with the tribulation saints. So that's an entirely different section that talks about ultimately Jesus is going to return. They're going to be mourning for him. They'll be resurrected Old Testament saints, etc. And I get into that in depth in my book called The Millennium Prophecies and the New Jerusalem. Oh, okay. Now, the last one I want to address, and thanks for letting me just continue to go on and on and on here. No, but I think it's very amazing. <laughs> I think this is groundbreaking, and I think it's very important. Some people try to use it to connect the Armageddon campaign with the Zechariah 12, 1 through 9, is the usage of in that day in Zechariah 12, verses 3, 4, 6, 8, and 11. Now, verses 3, 4, 6, and 8 in that day, it was talking about in the day of the siege of Judah and Jerusalem by the evil neighbors. Now, some people would say in that day has to be dealing with the day of the Lord. And that has to be dealing with Armageddon. Well, first of all, a lot of people believe the day of the Lord is the whole seven-year tribulation period, not just the last half or during the Armageddon campaign. So basically, uh, it wouldn't necessarily involve the Armageddon campaign. It would be the whole day of the Lord. So they say in that day has to be the tribulation period. I'm suggesting to you this happens before the tribulation period, Zechariah 12, 1 through 9. Matter of fact, a lot of these people who think it has to be in the day of the Lord would also say, well, wait a minute. I believe that when it says in that day in Ezekiel 38 verses 19 and Ezekiel 39 verses 11, that Gog and Magog invasion, they would say that in that day it happens before the tribulation. A lot of those people believe Ezekiel 38 for various reasons happens before the tribulation, that Russian, Iranian, Turkish invasion of Israel for plunder and booty, massive prophecy. Also, some of these people like Andy Woods and Mark Hitchcock they believe Isaiah 17 already found fulfillment in 732 by the Assyrian Empire. And it clearly says in Isaiah 17, 4, 7, and 9, in that day. So they would actually say that already found past fulfillment. Matter of fact, John Wolver, in his book, Every Prophecy of the Bible, tells us that in that day was used quite commonly in passages that have already found historical fulfillment. I'll give you a couple examples. In Amos 8, 1 through 14, Wolver says this Reference to in that day was fulfilled in the captivity period. Page 124 in Jeremiah 8, 1 through 3, those who dishonored God by worshiping idols would have their bones removed from their graves and exposed to the sun and moon as a token of God's judgment. This was fulfilled in that day. Uh, he talks about it in, again, Isaiah 7, verses 18 through 25, if they want to write, if viewers want to write this down. And also in Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 31, in that day, these are all historically fulfilled things where it says in the Bible, in that day. And we have historical proof as Wilward puts forward. That happened in that day historically during the captivities, etc. So that argument to me is, is one of the final arguments we had to address, but it still does not refute what we're saying here in the interpretation that in that day that the Arab countries, the evil neighbors are going to be utterly plucked up because they're going to make a final attempt to lay siege on Jude and Jerusalem. God's going to intervene in that day. God's going to empower the Israeli defense forces in that day. And because the Israeli defense forces are not fighting wars in the tribulation period, it has to be before the tribulation period. And why are they not fighting wars in the tribulation period? Because the tribulation period goes in two compartments. The first half, three and a half years. The second half, three and a half years. In the first half, the Jewish people are living in a pseudo-peace because they've so they've got a covenant of peace confirmed by the Antichrist in Daniel chapter 9. Unwalled villages. The covenant that gets confirmed in Daniel 9, 27 and Isaiah 28, verses 15 is what starts this Daniel's 70th week, the tribulation period for seven years. In the first half, they're at peace. They feel they got peace because of this covenant. It's a pseudo peace because it gets broken in the mid part of the tribulation when Zechariah 14, 2 happens and the armies gather against Jerusalem, ransack the houses, take over Jerusalem, take it captive, etc. That's when Jesus says flee. He doesn't say fight. He says Matthew 24, verse 15, flee when you see that happen. So in the first half, they're complacent. They can't even stop the Antichrist from taking over Jerusalem and going into the temple. 
Uh, the second half, they're not fighting, they're fleeing for their lives as the Antichrist is going to try to commit genocide. So they're not fighting in the first half, and they're not fighting in the second half. They're not fighting in the millennium, the Israeli Defense Forces, because we're told in Micah chapter 4 that there'll be no more war learned in the Messianic Kingdom, that the swords will be turned into plowshares and the spears will be turned into pruning hooks. So they're not fighting in the millennium, and they're not fighting in the tribulation. They have to be fighting before the tribulation. And I think that what we're going to see happen here is Israel and its war with Hamas is going to start to escalate. As we talked about earlier in the show, Israel is already talking about moving Hezbollah back north of the Lithani River because they've got to get their Israeli citizens who are living in hotels right now that belong back in their cities of the north, they get them back in their homes, and they're not going there because they're concerned about another massacre. So I think we need to be watching for a potential escalation of this Middle East war into the proxies of Iran, ultimately into Psalm 83 and the destruction of Damascus in Isaiah chapter 17. And that's not even to mention another prophecy, which is in Jeremiah chapter 49, dealing with Iran and verses 34 through 39, which may be another show, Jamie, we can tackle that one. But Iran is a subject of dual prophecies in the end times, Ezekiel 38 under the banner of Persia, and Jeremiah 49 verses 34 through 39 under the banner of Elam. And that's where Iran is probably going to get hit with a disaster as part of that prophecy, engaging with their proxies in a war with Israel. Um, I, I am like so blown away because I feel like, you know, your book is really a Bible study. I have to sit with a book and just read a little bit at a time and study the scriptures. I mean, this forces you to study the scriptures because the way you understand Bible prophecy and the future wars, I have never, ever seen anyone explain it the way you do. Um, so can you tell everyone where they can find your book? Um, the Future War Prophecies and other materials, uh, what what your website is. Yes, thank you very, again, Janie, for having me on your program. Uh, the website is prophecydepot.com, prophecydepot, like homedepot.com. We've got the products online store we got there. You can find it there. We've got lots of my articles and videos, like this one will be posted on our YouTube channel, et cetera. You can connect to those social networks on our website as well. Janie, thank you so much for having me on the program. I think it's important that people dive deep into these studies because God wants us to know what's going to happen. These are these are ancient prophecies that are going to roll off their parchments and pound down on the pavement, and they're not just going to affect the Middle East. They're globally impacting, and everyone will be affected. So we need all of your viewers to be you know paying attention to Bible prophecy and using it as a witnessing tool to equip themselves and to evangelize to their loved ones. Yeah, and speaking of evangelizing, um, I've heard you say, you know, of course, God loves all the people. He loves the Arabs. He loves the Jewish people. And I I thought it was really, really neat. Um, I heard you say how the Lord is appearing to so many Arabs, too, supernaturally. So, I mean, he loves everyone. He does. You know, matter of fact, in Iran is an example. As you know, it's so heavily persecuted by the mullahs and ayatollahs. Uh, it's actually the fastest growing evangelical population in the world. A stat came out a few years ago growing at a rate of 19.8%. Dreams, visions, miracles, and healings. Many Muslims are former Muslims now because they've converted to Christianity. Um, supernatural evangelism is taking place over there, a place where missionaries can scarcely get into nor want to go to. But God, because he loves them, is rolling up his sleeves and supernaturally accomplishing the will of his heart and bringing the lost, these Iranians, to himself. And that is the character of God. And that's why he put together the roadmap plan we talked about for peace in Jeremiah chapter 12, verses 14 through 17. A compassionate plan. He said, I, I want them to dwell, dwell, I'm paraphrasing, I want the Arabs and the Jews to dwell, dwell together in the midst of each other at peace. They can have their heritages and their cultures, but they need to swear by me, the God of the Bible, like they taught the Jews back at Jeremiah's time to swear by Baal, the false god. So it was a compassionate plan, even though they were evil neighbors, even though they needed to be plucked out of their land that was going to, now became Israel. He still loved them and had a compassionate plan in place 2,500 years ago that we've seen part one find fulfillment already in 20th century, and we're going to see part two find fulfillment in the 21st century. And unfortunately... It's not a land for peace still. It's an utter plucking up and destroying of those nations that are worshiping Allah, that are coming against the Jews, will make a final attempt to lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. 
Well, thank you so much for being on the show and um, definitely having you back again because I love learning. This this is amazing stuff. So thank you. And, and for those watching, um, please share this video and please subscribe and put a like. Thank you. Permanent lockdowns are coming soon. Watch this video now so you won't be caught by surprise.